and bird is a very has a very interesting problem. Uh, one we see maybe once or twice a year. So let me uh, show you where the problem is, and it's around here. And I don't know if you can see um, this big swelling here, but this is Bert's problem. He came in last week with the swelling, and the owner wanted to know what was going on. So Bert has what's called a perineal hernia, P-E-R-I-N-E-A-L. Now, you probably know that a hernia is a hole. Um, they happen quite often in men where they have a, a inguinal hernia, where the... Um, uh, which has to do with intestines going into the scrotum. Um, dogs get inguinal hernias as well in here. The most common hernia we see are umbilical hernias or belly button hernias. We see quite a lot of those in puppies. And they're typically fixed when the dog has desexing surgery, his or her desexing surgery. This is an unusual hernia. The perineal hernias are quite unusual. And let me go to his good side and with all these muscles here, they all crisscross, but there's one area just here where the crisscross allows a, a potential opening or a potential, potential hole. So the reason for this hernia is that Bert has an enlarged prostate, not cancer, it's just enlarged, which again is quite a common problem in older, big breed male dogs. And he's been straining to defecate for quite some while. Not hugely, just a small amount of straining. And as he's straining to, to, Europe, to uh, defecate, he's been pushing his intestines more and more and more into this potential space that I talked about. And eventually the intestines have pushed all the way through. They're now bunching up here under the skin and the perineal hernia you know, showed up a couple of days ago. Now, if we don't fix this, it'll get worse and worse and worse. So the, the surgery that we need to do is we need to push all his intestines back in and then suture this whole area up so that he, uh, so he doesn't re-herniate. It's a very difficult piece of surgery. It's quite a complex piece of surgery and it's uh, a, a very challenging piece of surgery. So there's a, a number of different ways to do the surgery and, and a number of vets have their own preference. Um, I use a uh, what's called an obturator flap, which is probably the most technically demanding of all the perineal hernia surgeries, um, but it also has by far and away the best results. So we'll, I'll, uh, you can come and join me in the surgery. As, as we get going and I'll show you exactly what we do and how we do it and how we're going to get Bert back to being a normal healthy dog. Uh, one thing I need to uh, also mention um, so I don't forget it later on, as I said a couple of minutes ago, older male large breed dogs commonly have an enlarged prostate, not cancerous, cancerous prostates are quite unusual in dogs but enlarged prostates are quite common. Now, why do they become enlarged? Well, they become enlarged because of the testicles producing testosterone. The testosterone continually stimulates the prostate and it gets larger and larger and larger. So as part of the fix for Bert's problem, we have to shrivel that prostate down so that he doesn't strain um, and, and you know, blow out the other side or destroy the side that we're going to operate on. So Bert, as well as having a perineal hernia repair, is going to be de-sexed so that the root cause, i.e. the testosterone and the male hormone, we get rid of that, then his prostate will shrivel down back to a normal size and he'll stop straining and hopefully all those problems will be uh, fixed. So I'll see you in the surgery. Hi, we're here with Bert. He's um, a very... Uh, in inglorious position, but this is how we have to operate. And he has a perfect suture in his anus, so he has to a lot of the surgery site. And the actual hernia is, is right there. You can see I can push my fingers in. So that's where the hole is. So I'm going to make an incision right down here, expose this whole area. And then there's a little muscle in here called the obturator muscle, which lines the 
inside of the pelvis. And as I said earlier, there's a number of ways to fix this, and the way I fix it is to use an obturator flat. So I'll take that muscle, elevate it off the pelvis, and then I'm going to flap it like this, and then suture it all around so that um, we um, remove that or fix that or repair that hernia. So it's a, it's a long procedure, it's a complex procedure. Uh, the results generally are absolutely excellent. So um, I'll, uh, we'll catch up again shortly. We're off. We started the surgery, we made my first incision down here. And then we've got all this massive scar tissue here. Uh, this has been going on for a long period of time. And I can get my finger and put it right up here into the abdominal cavity. So that's the hole we've got to fix. Now, you can't see it yet, but on the floor here of, of the pelvis, there is this muscle called the obturator muscle. So I'm going to take that muscle and flap it this way to suture that all closed and to repair this. But this is horrible. It's a lot worse than I thought it was. Um, obviously, this has been going on for a long period of time and gradually, gradually getting worse. And then the owner just saw this um, the other day. So I'll uh, catch up with you again shortly. Surgery. I just wanted to show you what I'm doing. It'll be hard to see, but... Um, you should be able to see something. So I've been moving thin muscle, and you can see it's very thin, very friable from all the all the damage that's been going on. I'm slowly getting it out of the pelvis, and then I'll be stitching it up like that to form a new um, floor for, 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 for this area. So uh, I know it's hard for you to see anything. It's hard for me to see anything. Um, but yeah, I just thought that might be uh, interesting. So we'll, we'll come back as we're closing. Welcome back. It's about an hour since uh, we last chatted. And I've just finished the, the first part of the surgery, which is the flat. Now, it would be very hard to, for you to see anything, but this area, I could poke and prod. I mean, you remember my finger went up to the third knuckle? Well, I, I can't get my finger in at all now. This whole area is the obturator. The obturator was lying on the floor of the pelvis here, the obturator muscle. So I've shelled it off the floor and popped it up this way. I've left one piece intact down there where the blood vessels come from. So the, the obturator muscle looks a little bit like an oyster, if you want to imagine that is the obturator muscle, and this is the, um, the, the, the pedicle where the nerves and the blood vessels come. So I've shelled it off the, off the pelvis and flopped it up like that. So the nerve supply is still all intact, and the, muscle is still, um, and the blood supply is still all intact. And now this muscle sits like a fan just um, covering this... Um, area and I've sutured all the way around here. There's lots and lots, there's probably about 30 sutures in there holding that oyster muscle in place. So that's the first step of the closure. The next step becomes closing all this dead space up. I can't just simply suture the skin, um, that uh, would cause all sorts of issues. So now, very gently, I've got to close this whole area up. One of the big th things about this area that I didn't explain earlier is that there's a massive number of major nerves and arteries and, and veins running around here. So it's it's uh, if you're not awake or watching what you're doing, it's very easy to either cut them or to inadvertently stick a needle through them. So that's something that makes this surgery very hairy indeed. Anyway, I'll go on with the next stage and then we'll catch up a little while. Now, I've... I showed you when we put the obturator flap in place, we've done three more layers of closure, and one of those layers was the subcutaneous tissue, which is the tissue just under the skin. So we're now to the stage of just doing the, uh, the skin sutures, and then we'll turn him over and desex him, and then we're done. So I'll see you after care is really important. I always regard surgery as, as having three components. One is the owner. 
one is the patient and one is me. And we all take one third responsibility for everything that goes on. I need to do my job. The owner needs to do his or her job and the patient needs to do his or her job. So the owner's job from, because my, my part of the job finishes when he goes home this afternoon and then it's the owner's responsibility now. I'll suggest some diet changes. We don't want him to strain from, um, from either too soft a diet causing him to have diarrhea or too firm a diet causing him to be constipated. So the owner's going to be a really important cog in his recovery with making sure that the faeces are not too soft and not too hard. And, um, and obviously this guy needs to uh, rest, recuperate, not play with his friends. And the owner's going to ensure that he's uh, confined on his own for two weeks. But after two weeks is up, he'll be hale and hearty again. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks when he comes back for the uh, suture removal.